Good evening. My name is Pet Naidu, and I'm your moderator for this evening's proceedings. Firstly, let us take stock of the workings of the webinar. Point one, kindly turn up your volume on your device. Number two, switch off all other applications on your internet connection. On questions, ask your question via the question panel that is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for presenters. So kindly use the question panel that is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The proceedings is recorded. It will be available on the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers YouTube channel via the SAIE website. Kindly look under the banner, past events and webinars. For extra accreditation, CPD accreditation, a certificate of attendance will be issued to all attendees. Thank you. Our agenda for today, we'll have a welcome and introduction from Mrs. Ntombende, who's the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers Power and Energy Section Chair. And the introduction will then be followed by a co-host address from the IEEE Power and Energy Society Chapter Chair for South Africa, and that is Esrom Malachi. And then at 18.30, Professor Rahman will join us from the United States to deliver his keynote address. And thereafter, we'll take questions, post his uh, delivery of the address, and we will respond to the questions. Let me at this moment also take time to place on record our appreciation to the administration of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. So a special thank you to Mrs. Averbos and team for all the support in hosting this webinar this evening. Thank you. Welcome to this evening's webinar. On behalf of the President and members of Council, thank you for your attendance. This evening's lecture is the inaugural lecture in a three-part series that will be delivered by Professor Rahman. Professor Rahman is the IEEE President-Elect for 2021, and his day job is Director of Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute based in the United States of America. These lectures are co-hosted in association with the IEEE Power and Energy Society, the IEEE South Africa Section, IEEE Africa Council, CIGRE, CIGRE Southern Africa, and the Southern African Power Pool. The next lecture is scheduled for 22nd July, and it will be followed by the third lecture on 13th August 2020. Our first speaker for this evening is Mrs. Ntombela, the chair of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers Power and Energy Section. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Engineer Strebil Ntombela. I'm the SAIEE Power and Energy Section Chair, and I'm employed by ESCOM Distribution. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all attendees and thank you for joining us this evening. Just a brief background of the Institute. The South African Institute of Electrical Engineers has been in existence since 1909, which is more than 100 years ago. It continues to provide excellent service to its membership in South Africa. As the power and energy section, our objectives are to promote and advance electrical engineering and associated sciences and applications to promote and uphold the professional standing of members of the Institute, to identify and promote the use of creative methods of applying electrical engineering and associated sciences in the interest of the South African community. Our mission is to support members in becoming more effective practitioners so that the quality of life of all communities in Southern Africa is uplifted, which is why we bring to you this evening the global electric power sector where we'll be engaging the environmental issues. 
I would like to appreciate and send a big thank you to IEEE for partnering with us in this webinar today. Thank you and over to you, uh, Prof Naidu. Let me introduce Ethra Malija, our co-host speaker. Ethrom received a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Pretoria in 2013. He's currently pursuing his PhD studies at the University of Johannesburg, and he holds his position as lecturer at the same university. His research interests are in the fields of power system optimization, smart grids, stochastic programming, electricity markets, and transactive energy. He's currently researching multi-objective optimization modeling and optimal placement of fax devices in a power system network and the effect of renewable energy on the placement of these devices. Esrom will take you through a presentation as chairman and co-host of the IEEE Power and Energy Society of South Africa. I'll hand you over now to my colleague Esrom Malachi. Uh, good. Oh, I saw I was on mute. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ezra Mashatz Malaji, as introduced. Um, so um, today I'm, I'm going to share a little bit on what is um, Power and Energy Society um, as an IEEE so um, society. Uh, I'm going to talk about our sister societies. Um, some initiatives that are supported by PS, um, some benefits of being a member, and I'm also going to um, introduce uh, the topic that uh, uh, Prof. Raman will be talking about. The IEEE um, Power and Energy um, uh, Society uh, provides the world's largest forum for sharing the latest um, technologies advancements um, in the electrical power industry. Uh, it develops standards that guide the development and construction of some of the equipment, and it educates members of the industry and um, the public in general. So this is our um, other IEEE sister society, the Industrial uh, Electronic Society, Industrial Application Society, Power Electronic Society, and Dielectric and Electrical Insulation Society. Some of these societies, we don't have a chapter in South Africa. And um, I will encourage you to um, maybe take over some of these societies. Some of the initiatives that are supported by PS are your um, IEEE Smart Cities. IEEE Smart Grid, IEEE Smart Village. Uh, in South Africa, we have um, started the initiative called the Smart Campus Initiative, and we are about to start an energy blockchain uh, initiative. And we will also urge members to, to support these two initiatives. Some organization that we work with is SIGRE, which will come on, on the later um, lectures. And uh, we've got the Chinese Society of Electrical Engineers, um, the Power and Energy Society of the Institute of Electrical Engineers of Japan and the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. What are the benefits that you get for being part of 
power in energy society you can get a free magazine free digital um subscription to electrification magazines uh, you get some discount on some conferences that are, are, are hosted by um ieee also you get a, um you receive continuous education and professional development hours by attending our plain talk so even this talk you will get um, the cpd points so today uh prof Raman will be talking about um, um, you know, some issues, some electrical issues that are actually um, in affect um, our environment. So I decided just to share a little bit on uh, like South African perspective, where are we in terms of you know, um, emissions and how are we engaging with the environment? So in South Africa currently, um, as you can see here, um, the biggest contributors of um, carbon dioxide emissions are your China, US, India, and we contribute 1%. Um, but if you can look, that 1%, we are equal to other developed states like your Australia, Turkey, um, even the UK and France. So some of the like how do we actually when we're talking about carbon dioxide emission in the country the biggest um, contributors are your electricity generation and this is because of our coal fired stations our industry um, commercial buildings and um, residential buildings but we also have a sizable 15 percent which is due to transport so this slide just shows you um, some of our uh, generation. We've got coal, hydro, um, electric, but majority uh, of our generation is coal, which are actually based here in Pumala. So coal remains, according to State South Africa, coal remains South African dominant source of energy. This light bite might be a bit older, but the states have then changed. So you've got around over 80% of our energy comes from coal, and then nuclear, which is actually 5%. Uh, and then you've got the renewables, which is sitting around um, 2%. So it's, it's, it's good to note that both the nuclear and your solar, these are actually some of the um, technologies that can help us actually to reduce our, our carbon footprint. So I bring this slide to um, you know, raise some concerns, um, or not concerns, but as much as we would also like to reduce our carbon footprint, um, we have to actually see, like economically, uh, what, uh, what is the impact? Are we impacted economically? So it seems as if um, for IPPs, uh, we are still paying uh, a lot uh, in terms of primary energy cost, but this value can go down in the future. Uh, your nuclear, you still paying um, a reasonable, I guess, uh, because you are generating around five percent uh, of the energy from from nuclear, and then you are generating around two percent from IPPs. But um, here the values are quite uh, different. So what is the solution uh, for a carbon-free South Africa or a carbon-neutral South Africa? If you look at the previous slide, it will look like a nuclear is a, it's a clear solution um, because we will be able to get our supply or base load from nuclear and it's also a carbon-free uh, technologies. For me, renewables um, can also, will also play a, a supporting role. Uh, and the renewables that we're looking at as wind, solar, um, and, and, and biogas. And um, one of the slides showed actually one thing that your, your transport sector also emit quite a lot, like 15%. So introduction of electrical vehicles will also help in reducing you know your the the, the the carbon emissions but the challenge with the electrical vehicles that we have now it's how are you going to power this 
electric vehicles because if you're going to power them from the power generated from coal then you are defeating the whole uh, purpose and uh, tonight i hope the lecture of uh, prof raman will also also highlight some of these things and that will, will be nice so if you want to contact me if maybe i said something that you are interested in these are my contacts and i think the these slides are going to be on the um, SIEE website, and then you are feel free to contact me. Uh, now I will move back to uh, Prof. Um, Naidu to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Esrom. We'll take questions towards the end. Let me introduce our speaker, our incoming speaker, the keynote speaker for this evening. And uh, Professor Saifur Rahman, and he's going to give us the talk on the global electric power sector engaging with environmental issues. Uh, Professor Rahman is the founding director of the Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech, USA, where he's the Joseph R. Loring Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He also directs the Center for Energy and the Global Environment. He's a Life Fellow of the IEEE and an IEEE Millennium, Millennium Medal winner. He was the President of the IEEE Power and Energy Society for 2018 and 2019. He was the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine and the IEEE Transactions on Sustainable Energy. He has published over 140 journal papers and has made over 400 conference and invited presentations. In 2006, he served on the IEEE Board of Directors as the Vice President for Publications. He's a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society in over 30 countries. He's the founder of BEM Controls, LLC, a Virginia, USA-based software company providing building energy management solutions. He served as chair of the U.S. National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for International Science and Engineering from 2010 to 2013. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech. Uh, thank you to Professor Rahman for affording us this inaugural lecture, and I'm going to transfer you to Professor Rahman and he's still coming on board so we'll give him a few minutes he's going to connect with us shortly while we wait for Professor Rahman to join us shall we take a few questions from Esrom anyone got a few questions for Esrom No questions for Esrom? Thank you, Mike Barker. We have a question on blockchain chain initiative, Esrom. Mike Barker would like to know a little bit more about blockchain initiative. Could you refer to your earlier webinar and possibly assist us with a response? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can yeah. hear you. So what we are trying, we are trying to put a team that can build a framework for, for blockchain in energy. 
uh, because currently there is no a proper framework, even in Europe and the US, there is no a proper framework. But we also want to build a framework that's South African or African, because we cannot go and copy another framework. So currently we haven't had any uh, meeting yet. We just seen people who said uh, they were interested. So we're going to actually schedule an inaugural meeting to, to discuss further on that. And then Mike uh, is welcome to join that. So you can email me and then we'll take it further. You, I have another question. Although you mentioned nuclear as a clear solution for decarbonization, it seems that there are no plans for additional nuclear capacity in the gazetted IRP. What are your thoughts on this? This comes from Kingsley Apeji. Uh, okay. Um, my, my thought, I, 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 I think uh, as, as uh, for example, SIEE and um, IEEE, um, you know, didn't play enough role in, in, into influencing that, that document uh, because I'm not sure it's either we were not given a chance or we were just inactive because we could have actually gave our own analysis into it. Um, currently, because for example, we're still um, working on our storage on renewable, renewable. So it is clear that something that can give us a carbon neutral um, environment tomorrow, it's nuclear at this point. And I'm not sure what was the thinking um, for government to go um, that route. But I'm also saying maybe we can also engage them on it. Um, I think it's some of the people that we need to invite in these kinds of talk so that uh, we can have a proper discussion. But I still think it was, um, yeah, it was an oversight from them. That, that's, that's my view on it. I may add, it, it is contained in the IRP 2019 document, and it's and it's put under the, the sort of heading as a no regret option to be considered. There's currently an RFI out from the Ministry of Energy to the effect of sourcing 2,500 megawatts of uh, nuclear, new nuclear capacity. And I think given the, the enormity of the nuclear option, there, there's going to be challenges and, and also uh, lots of work to go in before that could be pinned down to an exact date and time. So I think that we can put under work in progress and uh, over the next few months and years, we should be able to get some clarity on nuclear. Let me go on to Diaga's question. With the high amount of solar plants, are we still only 0.9%? There's been lots of investment in the, in the solar portfolio, especially by the independent power producers. Why are we only still at 0.9%, Esrom? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Diaga, um, you're, you're right. Uh, that, that slide might need to be um, updated, but uh, it's, it's not more than 2%. But you, you're correct. The, 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 there's more um, renewables coming into the, into the system. But we are also only considering the ones that uh, are going into the, the grid not normally the ones that you find at the mall, which also contribute positively, but we are only looking at the ones going into the grid. But yeah, the number, it's a little bit lower, you're right. Still, still in its infancy, I think we need to see lots more investment in solar come through. I've got one from Mevel Fish. Mevel Fish talks about uh, the difference in carbon produced by a coal-fired power station to charge an electric vehicle and then we make the same carbon emission savings from the same electric vehicle. So there's some sort of a dilemma there. Any comments on that, Esron? Yes, actually I tried to mention it. I'm not sure, maybe I was not uh, clear. So that's the problem. If you wanna charge electric vehicles with the power from uh, coal-fired stations, you are actually nullifying your benefits. That's very true. So we need to charge this electrical electric vehicles from actually renewable sources we need to charge them either from solar wind or biogas uh, for me like your municipalities like they have like sewage plants that they are not doing anything with them currently so if we can just turn all those sewage plants to be actually charging stations for these electrical vehicles you know that we will be doing something great 
Prof. So Naidu, for now, uh, Prof. Raman is with us now. Yes, yes. I see Prof. Raman has, has, has joined us. He's, he's getting ready to do his presentation. Let's take a question or two more. We'll let Prof. Raman settle down. How does this is from Mohammed Chand? How does the CO2 output of electric vehicles compare against that of petrol? There are different gases, but which is more harmful? Uh, Any I'm comments? Not, I'm not sure what he means there because um, he made electric vehicles we we are thinking they must have a, a zero emission like where, where does he get the emission into the electric vehicles from the coal if you charge them using a, a coal uh, energy from a coal I'm, I'm not sure maybe you can if you you have a, you, you understand what he means maybe you can also come in there prof yeah i'm also uh, uh, yeah i think it's probably referring to the earlier comment whereby we use car, coal to make the electricity and then charge the electric vehicle and then we try and save it off the petrol i think that's the dilemma mm -hmm. there yeah but that's, that's a no no that that we should we shouldn't go that yeah. that direction yeah let's take one from patrick is there any study that demonstrate that electric vehicle will reduce carbon emissions yes they are because the productions of batteries could be a lack of this technology I think I've answered that one for Patrick. There's lots of studies, Patrick, in terms of electric vehicles will reduce carbon emission. And, and I think the, the, the technology behind electric vehicles is that of uh, uh, fuel cells powered by hydrogen. So, so that's where the energy resource comes in, comes in from the hydrogen side. And then the fuel cell does the conversion of hydrogen energy to electrical energy. I think let's, let's take a break now and... Uh, Get ready to bring on Professor Rahman. Professor Rahman is going to join us. He's available. I'm going to change over presentation to Professor Rahman and uh, wish you well in... One, one second. Yes. This question that was raised just now, the question about the electric vehicle charging and CO2 emissions, I have those answers in my talk, yes. by the way. <laughs> oh, first class, first class. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Prof is going to talk just about that. Thank you very okay. much. Let me give you give you the stage. Over to Professor Rahman. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen now. Okay. Show my screen. I go back. Hold on a second. First slide. First slide. Very good. So very good. Can, we can see you. Thank you. Can see my slides now. Yes. Let me full screen. Hold on a second. Uh, I put all the logos pad that you suggested yesterday. First class. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now I am showing my story. Showing right. my screen. You're live also, Professor Rahman. You're live. Yes, I'm live. You can see me. I can I can hear you clearly. So I'm just waiting when you are ready. Uh, start i'm, well, I'm you are ready we've handed over to you now you you proceed thank you very much okay good afternoon good evening my friends in south africa i am very happy to be able to speak with you in front of you i see ieee south africa section ieee power energy society chapter sigra southern africa and sap south africa power pool all of them are my friends i'm happy to be in a in a known company. So as I said, this talk focuses on global electric power sector and how we engage with issues of environment, including electric vehicles. I'm glad this question came up. I have an answer for those questions that was just raised. Okay, moving on down then, this is the situation today. First of all, on the left-hand side, as of 2019 or 2017, data came from 17, what is the breakdown of the source of electricity globally? 38.3%, just over a third, comes from coal today. Natural gas, 23% roughly, number two. Number three is hydro, 16%. Four, nuclear. Five is wind. Six is oil. 
than biofuel and other things. So this is the global situation three years ago, the latest data available. On the other side, if you look at the top 10 countries consuming electricity, top 10, energy-wise, not power, energy-wise, China about 5,000 trillion watt hours, number two, US, India three, Japan, South Korea, all of that. I give you the top eight, nine countries globally. So this is the fuel usage issue. Next page talks about, again, the same data, the amount numbers. China is 7,000 trillion watt hours. Number one, US about 60%, then things fall off quickly. US, China, then smaller numbers. So this is the global situation. My focus is who are the big producers, what fuel they're using, and how much CO2 they're contributing. That's the focus now. Okay, let's move on then. Look at this picture. Coal is a big issue, we saw. Today, coal is 38% responsible for electricity generation globally. Now, where is the things happening? 75% the global demand for coal comes from Asia, 75%. India, China is a big number. China, India, then the rest of the Southeast Asia, and the rest of the world. So you see, the rest of the world coal is much smaller than even China alone. So this is interesting. If you look at the right-hand side of the picture here, from Economist Magazine, you see the coal-fired, capacity receiving new investment, very important issue, new investment. You see, go back 10 years ago, 2010, China was receiving investment for about 60 gigawatt in one year, 60 gigawatt. That number 2018 became like five gigawatts. So China has significantly slowed down the coal new coal power plants. In 2010, if I say total was 100 gigawatt for coal, new investment, new. Today at 2018, new was about 23 gigawatt. So 20%, 80% drop in new coal power plant investment, very important. In the US, nobody that I know is investing in new coal-fired power plant, new. My state, Virginia, produces coal, coal-producing state. We export coal. Virginia, the big utility, Virginia Power, publicly said they will not build any more coal-fired power plant, no more. World Bank, World Bank has said bank will not invest in any coal plant globally. This is the situation. Let's see where we are going from there. Two issues, one is existing, one is new. Look at this number on the left-hand side. Top 20 countries that emitted the most CO2 in 2016, the data list, I have available data latest. To. China number one, 9,000 million metric tons. Then the US, India, Russia, all the way, I don't see South Africa number 14 here, is a coal producing, so it's number 14. Now on the right-hand side, more recent data, 2019, right-hand side, China, one country, is responsible for 29% of global CO2 emission. One country, 29%. Second highest US, 16. So if you look at China, 29%, rest of the world is 19%. So China produced more CO2 in 2019 than rest of the world, except those few countries on the left-hand side. South Africa, only 1%. Brazil, 1%, a lot of hydro. Indonesia, 1%. Saudi Arabia, 2%. Canada, 2 A very small number. So let's see what China is doing to move things out of the way. So this is top 20 countries emitted most CO2 2016, total country-wise. China said that's not good. China has four times as many people as the US does. So if you look at per capita, China said we're not that bad. Let's look at this picture right here. The per capita now, not total. 
guess what? Saudi Arabia, number one. No, not China, US, nobody. Number one, Saudi Arabia. Two is Australia, because a lot of coal. Three is US. Four is Canada, because of the, uh, the, the, the oil base, uh, tar, 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 South Korea, Russia, Japan, South Africa, number 10, per capita. So if you go back to the previous slide, South Africa is 10 per capita. Here it was 14. Total is 14 per capita 10. This is interesting. I will deal with India, only 20th per capita. So this is interesting. What's happening globally? Now let's look at this. Let's focus on fossil fuel emission from combustion and other processes, meaning cement production. China number one, 30%, US 15, EU 9, India 7, Russia 5, Japan 4, other countries 30%. Again, big players are China, US, India to some extent. Fine. If I go to the next slide, this is where is the CO2 coming from on the left hand side of the screen? 44, this is not one country globally now. 44% of the global CO2 emissions come from coal burning. 34% oil burning, it's not electricity now, all oil in a, in a car like we talked about before, not just electricity, overall. So coal 44, oil 34, goes 20%. On the left-hand side. Right-hand side is by country, who are responsible for CO2 emissions. Overall now, get your cement factory, power generation, transportation, all that put together. OECD countries, with developed countries, US part of that, almost 36%. Second highest, China, 28%. In the year 2016, the world emitted 32 billion tons of CO2, 32 billion. Today is close to 38, 40 billion today, 2020. Again, where's the source? Fine, let's move on. If you look at Europe alone, source of CO2 emissions in Europe, five years ago, what came from? Came from energy, which is electricity primarily, manufacturing. I'm not saying fuel here, talking about source of CO2 from the activities. Energy production, 31%, manufacturing, 22%, household, you need your homes, your offices, light, air conditioning, all of that. Transportation, not that bad, only 12%, and rest are small. So again, source of emission of CO2 from energy production, manufacturing industry, households and the like. Fine, we'll get to these later on. Now look at this. What has China done or doing? If I go back to China 10, 20 years ago now, 20, 2001, the renewable contribution was 25%. Normal was 74% roughly, China. Come forward 2016, the hydro solar has gone up from 25 to 33.8. Thermal came down 73 to 63. 2018, two years ago, renewable 37%, thermal 60%. Coming forward five, 10 years from now, more than half in China will come from solar wind. 40% thermal, mainly coal. Remaining 8% is primarily nuclear. That's my point. Some countries taking note that this is not sustainable to keep on burning more and more coal, which is a good sign. Now, this is the issue that came up earlier today. Anthropogenic carbon emissions, meaning where is the source of carbon dioxide? This data 20 years old, I have a reason for showing that now. Electric power plants was a third, transportation number third, Direct is industrial like cement manufacturing, 12%. Residential, commercial, 12%. 20 years ago, 
If I get data for now, about 20 years hence, now, power plants below 30%, transportation closing 40% because of so many cars on the street, and most of them are either gasoline or diesel. So that's the interesting switch. So transportation was third, now it's close to 40%. Now, this is important, greenhouse gases. We talk about CO2, but there are many other greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. Look at the bottom of the screen, 1997, the emissions from fossil fuel burning and cement production was 30 billion tons, 97. 2018, became 41 billion tons. Only CO2. CO2 goes in the sky, lives there for over 100 years, just stays there, and creates a film on Earth, so the sunlight coming in gets trapped, and that's where, that's where the heat, global warming happens. Light comes in through the CO2 cloud, come no problem. Heat wave is longer than light wave, cannot escape. That's the greenhouse effect, and the world gets warmer. Look at these six gases, CO2, methane, and so on and so forth. Now look at this. Global warming potential for these six gases. My reference is CO2, one. Methane, 28 times. Nitrous oxide, 265 times. Hydrofluorocarbon, 138. Perfluorocarbon, 6,600. SF6, 23,000 more potentially more damaging than carbon dioxide. The good thing is, very little SF6 escapes, a lot of CO2 escapes, like talk about slide before, 30 billion, 40 billion tons. My point is, when you talk about global warming, just do not stick to CO2. Methane is a big number. Hydrofluorocarbons, this is your, 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 uh, your, meth your, your uh, air conditioning gases, uh, fr 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 freezer gases. SF6, 23,500 times. Now look at this picture. Again, this picture shows the, those gases, CO2, methane, all that. If you factor in their concentration, like 23,000 times, with that factored in, CO2 responsible for three quarters of the global warming gas emitted into the atmosphere. Next was methane, then nitrous oxide, SF6, hydrofluorocarbon only 2% because their numbers is high, potentially high multiplier, the amount is small, that's the difference. Okay, now let's talk about US, 2017. Carbon dioxide was 82% of US global, global warming gas emission, CO2. Methane next 10%, nitrous oxide 3%, 6%, and other fluorinated gases 3%, US numbers. Now, what since methane is the next most important culprit here, let's look at where is methane coming from. Sources of Atmospheric methane, natural well, only wetland, the trees and weed submerge the rot. If a if a biomass rots, it gives you methane. Simple as that. Rice fields again, biomass. Emission from livestock production systems, like literally cows, and it's a big deal in New Zealand, by the way. <laughs> Their biggest global warming gas emission, not from CO2, from methane. In New Zealand. Biomass burning, like forest fires. We had a situation in Brazil last year, a lot of forest fires. Then if you burn a tree, CO2 that was that was, that was held comes up. And aerobic decomposition of organic waste in landfills. Again, you go landfill, dump your household garbage, the methane comes up. And of course, when you talk about exploration of natural gas, in many cases, when you drill for oil, natural gas comes out. That's methane, right? Natural gas is methane. That it escapes into the air. That is why they flare this, they burn it. 
So don't escape into the air. As an example. I know I've got a lot of things I'm throwing at you now, but I want you to think it is a very complex situation. I have time at the end to answer questions, so be, be patient. This is a very important slide. The impact of electricity from various sources. I'm looking at how many grams of CO2, SO2, and NOx you produce per kilowatt hour of electricity that you are manufacturing. If I make electricity one kilowatt hour from natural gas, look at the column on the right, just for CO2 for now. So one kilogram of one kilowatt hour electricity from natural gas produce half a kilogram of CO2, half, right, 0.49. Oil, same electricity, one kilowatt hour will produce three quarter kilogram of CO2. If that same electricity came from coal, 1,000 gram or one kilogram. That's the rest you can figure out later on. This is the issue. Let's focus CO2 now. That means if you left 100 watt light bulb on overnight by mistake, 100 times 10 is 1,000, one kilowatt hour, you have helped to produce one kilogram of CO2 into the sky. I tell my students, turn the lights off. If you leave them on, that's what you do. Keep that numbers in mind. We'll compare these as we go forward. Okay, now, people say hydropower is benign. It is not benign. Hydropower causes methane and therefore impacts global warming. If you look at the picture in front of you, I got two water levels, the light blue and almost white. Low water, high water. Whenever you build a dam to flood land to hold the water level high to run a hydro plant, you are by definition flooding plants by definition because you don't put a hydro dam in a, in a desert that you will flood some vegetation by definition. What happens that plant will decay and methane comes up. You see the arrow in the middle of the picture, the bubble and arrow, that's what's happening. That's one. Second is the water level goes up and down throughout the season, different seasons. Low water could be winter time, let's say in Asian countries, water comes down, then trees and plants grow on the side of the bank, which is fine, it'll grow. Then as the monsoon season comes, water level goes up, it'll submerge that newly grown vegetation and create methane. Exactly, this is the thing. What does it mean? Look at this picture. Where are the hydro plants causing this kind of damage? Canada is it big? US? I see this. Canada, 6.5 million hectares is covered because of hydro. US, 6.98. Brazil, 3.9. China 5.8, India 4.5, Russia's highest, about 8 million hectares are flooded because of the hydro projects. We don't think this way. The hydro is not a benign source. It is producing a lot of global warming because of methane, because of submerging vegetation. Okay, now let's compare. Hydropower is not emission free. I just told you the first line you've seen before, one kilowatt hour of coal electricity releases 1,090 grams of CO2, coal. Hydro, because of the flooding in CO2, hydro doesn't produce CO2, it produces methane, and methane is the CO2 equivalent, quarter kilogram, 225 gram, of CO2 equivalent for global warming issues coming from hydro plant. Now, last one is your question from the last talk. One liter of gasoline releases three kilogram of CO2 from manufacture to use in your car. What I mean by manufacture, I'm going all the way to the starting point. I drilled for oil in Saudi Arabia. I produce some CO2. You saw Saudi Arabia is number one globally for CO2 emissions, not because they have a lot of coal, because of the gas oil business, a lot of CO2 comes out. 
So now you can compare the questionnaire can have this answer. What is the question was the where does the energy come from to run your electric car? If you are running gasoline, have this reference number. Three kilogram of CO2 you're producing for your car. One liter of gasoline. Now you figure out how many liters you're burning to produce electricity to produce the power for your car. You can figure this out. This is only come out that yes, if you are using cold fire generation to run your electric vehicle, that means you're replacing gasoline. The answer you have to find out how much energy you are using to run the coal plant, one kilowatt or thousand grams of CO2, and how much CO2 you produce from the car. You can figure this out. The answer is, is, is very clear here. Okay. What can we do to solve this problem? Of course, if you are focusing on electricity now, we are all power people. I'm not talking about transportation, I'm not talking about cement manufacturing, all the others, I'm not, I'm not going there. Let's focus on what we are comfortable with. To reduce carbon emissions, one is, of course, use less electricity. If you use less, fine. Or number two, use less fuel to produce electricity. That means more, more solar, more wind, more nuclear, not coal, oil, and uh, gas. And of course, as a result, we should look at producing more power, electricity, from renewables and nuclear. Fine. Now let's look at this picture, how things are changing globally. If you see the left-hand side of this picture, 2018, China had 700 gigawatts of renewable capacity in operation. Next is US, about 260 gigawatt, and so all the way down to France, about 50 gigawatts. That's the left-hand side. Then the question is, out of the renewables, what is the source? Right-hand side of the screen. About half is hydro today, 2018 numbers. About a fourth is onshore wind, 20% solar, and other biomass, solid fuel, fine. Big thing is hydro, wind, and PV are the main renewable sources today in operation. So then the question is cost. If you look at the cost of electricity from various sources, you look at the, the uh, green line biomass, and at the bottom of the scale is 5 cents, 10 cents, up to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So biomass is very diverse pricing because of the source. The red bar, red line on each bar is the global average. So global average for biomass-based electricity is cheapest, almost cheapest, than others. Geothermal, the range is not that high, the red line next one, hydropower, can very inexpensive. Forget the, the methane part now, just the cost of energy because of the high volume cases. The average hydropower cost globally of five cents a kilowatt hour. Then solar PV, not bad. CSP, thermal solar, offshore wind, and onshore wind. Onshore wind is about the cheapest after hydropower globally. So about six cents a kilowatt hour, which can compete favorably with, with, with coal in today's market. This is the pricing as of 2019 data. So bottom line, what do we do? First of all, bullet number one, efforts in the electric power sector to replace fossil fuel with nuclear and renewable help, of course. If you don't do that, the right-hand side picture is your glacier melting, which is the situation is very difficult. B bullet number two is the one you have been talking about. We can power guys, we can go to solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, fine. But you cannot run your car using solar power. You can, but on paper, but not in reality. So you have to burn some fuel, like you do today, gasoline, or diesel, or use electric vehicle, which would run on electricity from nuclear or, or, or hydro or, or, or PV. 
for the whole things. Another question is, yes, we think about large scale EV deployment will help, but if you are getting electricity or electric vehicle using coal, doesn't help you much. The challenge is, fine, I get it. I will run my electric car, but I have to know where is the power coming from that is generating the power electricity I'm using in my car. That is something we need to discuss socially to make sure we're not creating a different problem by solving another problem. That's the bottom line. Okay, I think I am done, but let me give you some comments about people asking me these questions. First of all, COVID-19 and IEEE, where are we there? We all know, especially US now, this COVID-19 outbreak is very fast moving, uncertain and complex. We don't know why things are happening, but we are optimistic. We know we'll recover when I do not know, but they have a new normal. New normal means more social distancing, maybe masks, maybe other things. But for that to be our life, we cannot just withdraw from it. We believe we should be more cooperative, collaborate more, and have more spirit community-wise that we can solve this problem going forward as an IEEE member. For that to happen, we have to make IEEE broader and more relevant to the work our members do, regardless of they are a school teacher, I mean, they are a science teacher, or a professor, or ESCOM engineer, or nuclear plant operator, doesn't matter. We have to take everybody's thinking into account so that we are dealing with this in a collaborative way. That's my belief. We need more participation from volunteers globally in IEEE governance. We, right now, mostly in North America based. So if we can get people in South Africa, all of Africa, Middle East, Europe, Asia, of course, and then we can be truly global in terms of us living what we talk about. This is my message going forward. This is it, this is my last slide. I want to share my email address with you. I'm running as president elect this year. My point is, I know I'll get some questions now. I can answer most of them, but I've seen in the past questions too many for us to answer in the remaining time we have. So please feel free to write to me on this email address. I'll be happy to answer. Also, I have a website, which has a lot of information about things we just talked about, srahman.org. If you like, no, no rush, go there. You'll see today's talk I just gave. I have posted this talk on my website already. So if you missed the talk, if you want to go back and re review a few things, please be my guest. Go to their website, webinar page, and figure it out. Also, for the younger generation, I'm on Facebook, I'm in LinkedIn, I'm in Twitter, I'm in, uh, in uh, YouTube as well. So that's where it is. Pat, I'm done. We can take questions if you like. Oh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Excellent presentation, excellent clarity. So you can go back and take over. I am, I am, uh, I can, I We're can gonna stop take talking. some questions. Yeah, time for questions. Let us start okay, with the question. We've got, we've got a couple oh, of questions. Please. I'm not sure if you want me to take a few of those questions and see how far we go with that. Let, let's start with Mike Barker's question. Mike Barker says, in God we trust, all of them must bring data. Can South African universities help ESCOM develop a public dashboard so we can all keep an eye on them in real time? So there's something from Mike Barker. And Mike, thank you very much. We'll follow up on that request and we will go forward. Let me ask my colleague to take, uh, take the next two questions. Over to you, Mrs. Ndumbandle. Thank you, Prof. I've got a question from Melville Fish. He says, what is the difference in carbon produced by coal-fired power stations to charge the EV and the carbon emissions saved by the same EV? If that's a good question. I have not done the numbers yet, but the average numbers are, again, depends on the EV. What is it? Is it a truck? Is it a car? Is it getting, I don't know, 40, uh, 40 kilometers per 100 uh, kilowatt hour? Those things have, have to be discussed, of course. 
a rule of thumb is a regular car, EV, regular car, sedan for for uh, for passenger car. If you're running your car using power electricity from a coal fire station, as opposed to uh, gasoline, you are producing net more CO2 than you avoid by burning oil in your car. But again, that number can change because of the car size, because of efficiency, because of the fuel, and because of the, uh, the loss of electricity from the power station to your car. Next question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Mohammed. It goes, how does the carbon dioxide output of electric vehicles compare against that of petrol? There are different gases, but which one is more harmful? Well, CO2 is CO2. The issue is the amount of CO2. So the question is, if you are running your car 100 kilometers, maybe on two days, that's the that's the number in comparing. Are you better off running that car using petroleum, or using electricity from coal-fired power station? That's the comparison. Answer is if you're using coal-fired power station to run the electric car, you're producing more CO2. But if you're running that car using natural gas-fired electricity, then of course you're using less CO2. That's what we are focusing on here. Next question. Thank you, Prof. Uh, let me take this one from Patrick. One of the good methods of data analysis is also to take the CO2 emission per inhabitant. Have you done such an analysis, Prof? Very good question. Uh, I'm not going to go back to my slide, but just repeat what I showed you earlier. This is a global debate. Who is producing more? And who's producing more per person? You see the number, China, if you look one country, one country, nine billion tons, three, four years ago, nine billion tons of CO2, one country. US about 4.7 billion tons, about eight, five billion tons, 60% per total. US two, China one, and so on. One table. The second table I showed per capita. Per capita CO2, Saudi Arabia is the highest, not China, not India, not, not South Africa, not, uh, not US, because they have so much CO2 produced by oil production, and that all goes out. But we always look at the source of CO2 where it is emitted. So that's why Saudi is number one per capita, and China is number one in total number. Thank you. There's the one from my colleague, Sigre colleague, Prince Moyo. What are US plans for phasing out SF6? You've shown SF6 has 24,000 times the impact than carbon dioxide. Before we phase out, we have to know how much we are releasing to the atmosphere. We, didn't, we don't even know right now how much is being released. No idea. So first thing that we have been talking in the US is do an inventory that how much new SF6 you are pumping to your equipment every year that means rest was released to the atmosphere we have we don't have the number yet we have one we have the number then you can figure out why that is happening is it leaking is it is it happening because when you recharge the uh, equipment the equipment is not fully uh, tight it releases we don't know those answers yet once i know that how much is being is being released how much is leaking why that is leaking then you can put some regulations in place you must do this and this so that you can minimize your leakage we don't know that yet nobody knows that yet no thank you for that prof uh, there's one from anthony kutsi he talks about europe shutting down their nuclear power stations any comment on that it's a political decision. Europe, meaning England, is well, England is building a nuclear plant now. Germany said it'll shut it down. France is the highest nuclear power country in the world today. 
those are political decisions. Germany, after Fukushima thing, they said no more new nuclear, number one, and shut down the existing ones over time. Is it good or bad? Depends on whom you ask. Right. It is true that you cannot have a system with 100% solar today because of the intermittency and because of the cost of backup power and, and storage. Then the question is, how much nuclear can you tolerate? German people said zero. UK said small, but still going. In the US, look at, hear this carefully. In the US, we have not started getting power from a new nuclear plant since 1978. 1978. All the ones are going from before. US government during the past administration gave some guarantees to build four nuclear power plants in the US, two, two locations to each. Out of the four, two have gone bankrupt. They said, we don't want it, cancel it. Other two are ongoing, but have not come online yet. So nuclear is not just the issue of public, public concern and risk, money, extremely expensive. So if I want to compare today, nuclear with, 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 with uh, wind, wind comes out much cheaper, but wind is not blowing all the time. So this is why we have to ask that question, how much nuclear can you tolerate? I have asked Chinese friends of mine who asked that question. You are so big on coal, you're pushing uh, nuclear, you're pushing hydro, pushing wind, pushing solar, why not nuclear? The answer is nuclear depends on nuclear fuel, uranium. China doesn't have enough uranium in, in, in the country. And they don't want to be sandwiched in global politics and lose their source of uranium oxide to run the nuclear plants. So this is another issue, the fuel security issue. So this is not just power, it's not the money. Fuel security, national priorities, government policies, all of that have to come into play to get an answer. And every country is different answer. Russia, one answer. China, a different answer. UK is just building a nuclear plant now. France is building. Germany said no. And most other countries said no no nuclear. US, as I said, nothing has come online in the last 40 years. New ones. Then. So I know that's a good answer, but that's the real answer. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. It, it just goes to show the complexity of these, these decisions and, uh, and, uh, and the impact that will have on, on the common user of electrical energy. There's right. one from Dr. Modley, ESCOM Research. Dr. Modley wants to know that Given that South Africa does not have natural gas, does this mean that an ideal future generation mix would tend to be nuclear and renewables? Is that what we're looking at? I think so, but South, South Africa doesn't have natural gas, but you have natural gas nearby other countries. So I'll answer that question indirectly. Virginia, my state, where we have domestic coal resource, significant coal resource, we used to be coal-based 10, 15 years ago, primarily coal. The major power company in Virginia, the management has said, our Virginia's future for electricity is natural gas and solar, maybe a little bit of nuclear. That's the answer, middle nuclear. We have no natural gas in Virginia, but we can get from other states. So South Africa can think the same way. You have no domestic natural gas, but you can get natural gas from other countries nearby. Now you can talk about fuel security. Well, uh, how does it work? Depends on what relationship you have with other countries. And one more thing I should add here. If every country wants to produce enough electricity within their own borders and not depend on source of power from other countries, I think that is a short-sighted approach. Like South Africa Power Pool, a good example here, SAP, 
they are looking at South African, not, not, not Southern African portable, not South African portable, Southern Africa portable. So they depend on other countries buy and sell. So you should have some kind of plan so that you can go to other countries who have more resources to get power from them into your country. But in order to have some interdependency, put some other conditions in place which would not allow the gas supply country to turn it off. Because if they turn the gas off, they have to suffer some other way. We have this totally new idea going on globally today. I work with the International, International Energy Agency, IE in Paris, that same issue. How do you guarantee for a receiving country, receiving electricity from a neighbor, that they are not hostage to the sending country's political, political wind, let's say. So this is a bigger issue about fuel security. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, in fact, Kingsley asks the very same question. To what extent can regional cooperation and energy, regional energy sufficiency, is national energy sufficiency a necessary precursor for regional energy sufficiency? So there you are. You've answered it already. And I think my colleagues from the Southern African Power Pool would have much joy in, in, in debating that point further. Let's take one from Wari Sinkala. He's just sent one in now. Research shows carbon capture and storage technologies can take up up to 90% of carbon we produce from electricity. This tells me we already have a solution for CO2 emissions. Your thoughts on carbon capture and storage, Professor? I have done the research myself for many years now. It's good on paper, but not practical for two reasons. One is cost, very expensive. I've done numbers from in Japan. If you run a cold fired power plant and try to capture 90% number you just said of the CO2 coming out of the smokestack, the energy you use to do that process, you'll use up 20% of the production of power from that power plant just to capture that, not money. Energy needed to capture and process it, number one. Number two, where do you hold it? You pump it to a salt mine or some reservoir. It stays there. How do you guarantee it did not leak after 50 years? No, no guarantees. You cannot put it under the ocean. You can, but then it can bubble up. So carbon capture, in theory, makes sense. But practicality is not that useful. You can say, well, CO2 is good. I use uh, for soda, right, for CO2 in your coke to do that. So this going on in Texas today, there's some and company who use CO2 for other purposes, for industrial processes, they have built a pipeline to get the CO2 from the power station to their factory to use it for something else. But those are unique examples. Those are not globally viable because there's so much CO2 coming out. As I said, 40 billion tons today, not all from power, of course, maybe 20%, other are from cement, transportation, and the like. Big thing is the airlines, CO2, big debate today. So you are traveling from Cape Town to Sweden per passenger, how much CO2 you have produced? All of that gone in the sky and sitting there. That you cannot capture. So yes, on paper is, is possible, but we have to release less, not release uncontrolled and, and capture it. Now, well spoken, Professor, well spoken. Let's take one from Patrick on nuclear. Patrick, nuclear waste and nuclear the waste. requirement for storage of nuclear waste and uh, the challenge that one would have going into the future. Uh, any comments on that in, in terms yes, of yes, nuclear very, waste management? Very relevant, I'll give two examples, very relevant question. Nuclear waste is a big issue. U.S. government, U.S. power industry has no policy on how to deal with the nuclear waste. Don't, don't have policy. They talk about Yaka Mountains in New Mexico and then Nevada. Get this, get the uh, spent fuel, process it, concentrate it, and put it in underground caves. 
in theory. The problem is when you process the nuclear fuel, you create plutonium, highly toxic. That is why about almost 40 years ago, US government said US will not allow nuclear fuel reprocessing, would not allow because of, because of the issue of plutonium, plutonium uh, yeah. released to the atmosphere. It's not done. What is that today? Nuclear power plants have, we call swimming pools. In the swimming pools, you put the fuel rod, spend fuel, and they sit there. One example. Example in France is different. France is reprocessing the spent fuel, take out some uranium, get some plutonium, which is stored somewhere, and it works fine. This is a big issue with Iran today, the fuel reprocessing. Japan, I used to work in Tokyo as an engineer at Tokyo Electric. Japan has, as you know, significant amount of nuclear power, number going down because of Fukushima, but they cannot reprocess fuel in Japan because of security safety issues. What do they do? They deal with French, French, French companies come to Japan, pick up the spent fuel, take it back to France, do the reprocessing, and send them fresh fuel. Bangladesh, I have an example here, has a contract with Russia to build a nuclear power plant 1200 megawatt times two under construction now. Same deal. Bangladesh would not be allowed to reprocess the fuel because of safety issues. So Russia has agreed to take out the spent fuel back to Russia, reprocess, and send them fresh fuel. Problem. Russia, I'm, I'm very, very practical. Russia is a good friend of Bangladesh today. No problem. We we'll guarantee 10 years from now, Russia would not be a good friend anymore. Then what happens? See the problem? Then you start with a government that you don't uh, get along with. That's your source of fuel. The answer is you shut down the power plant. That's a decision that you have to make political, politically charged situation. But my point, I'm a professor first, not a power engineer. I'm very open. I want to point out the difficulties, uncertainties you have to deal with 10, 20 years from now. So this is the thing politicians have to discuss. What is my answer? Is no good answer yet. No, well said, well spoken. Shall we take a last question from Mr. Samuya? And he's given us a good question here. He says, Mr. Samuya, he talks about electric vehicle uh, growth on the distribution network. Uh, in terms of system stability and reliability, what would be your recommendations, Professor? Good question. As we all know, the electric vehicle penetration is going up in most countries. Issue is, if I look at a Tesla car today, 60 kilowatt hour battery, even it's charged in two hours, you can, you're drawing 30 kilowatt from the grid for your house. Your house, in my house here, most homes, total load is not even 30 kilowatts without the electric car. Then you're doubling your household demand overnight. That means the transformer, the switch gear, supplying your house and your neighbor's homes are overloaded. So this is a significant issue. We got to be very careful. Power company says power company has to upgrade the equipment, mainly transformer. Who pays for it? And California, if you want to put electric vehicle on your property, mainly bigger ones like Tesla, you have to pay extra money so power company can upgrade their circuit to short wheel load. That's a cost we have not talked about yet. Now, thank you, Professor. Uh, colleagues, let us close at this point. I think we've exhausted the questions now. There's still a few there. We'll post them on the website and we'll, we'll respond to them and have them completed. May I take this opportunity of thanking Professor Rahman for an excellent lecture, an excellent perspective on this challenge that we've got. And let's see how best we could collectively charter the way forward, given the challenges of COVID-19 and the new normal that we all have to work towards. Professor Rahman's next lecture will be on 22nd of July, and he'll be talking about energy efficiency in smart buildings. 
uh, focusing on the Internet of Things and sensor technologies. And then on the 13th of August, we'll take the third lecture in this series, the role of smart grids in facilitating the introduction of renewable energy resources. So with, with those words, thank you to Professor Rahman. Thank you to all the colleagues that have joined us at this webinar this evening. Uh, on behalf of all the co-hosts, we say our grateful contribution to all of you and to Professor Rahman. Thank you. Good night and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.